Okay, welcome back folks for a second installment here. Uh, we left off last time uh, deciding that we had to evaluate an integral uh, of this form here, uh, integral rho of x times v of x, rho being the probability density of the electron. We said that was necessary because the electron is not a point particle in this, in, in this framework, it is smeared out and so it samples over multiple potential energy points. Okay, and so that's the integral we have to do. Um, so let's do it. Okay, here it is. Um, <clears throat> so one thing to remember is that this V of X, that's the uh, potential energy that the electron sees from the lattice, is a function that is strictly periodic. Uh, uh, with a periodicity of the lattice constant. It repeats, okay, there's, there's no question about it. This here is a repeating function. Um, so um, we can write it therefore uh, in terms of a Fourier series. Every repeating function can be written um, as a uh, Fourier series and here it is. Uh, okay, so we're basically um, adding up a whole bunch of cosines together. We are, here we're assuming that the function is even, okay, the eventual function. Uh, we're placing basically the, uh, an atom or an ion at the origin. So we don't have the sign terms, but we're just adding up the cosines. Each one gets a Fourier coefficient, which I'm going to label V sub G. G is, uh, is uh, a positive integer, okay starting from one, so one, two, three, four, and so I can also write this simply as a sum um, like that, right? So the first one is, it has, a, has a, a wave number of two pi over eight, next one is twice that, and the next one will be three times that, and so on. So that's just a standard for your series that I'm writing this periodic function, V sub X, V of X uh, as. Okay, so, so far so good, I can do that. Okay, yeah, for your series. Okay, uh, one thing that you notice is that there isn't a constant term that you usually get um, out front. Uh, we left this off, we'll come, we'll come, we're gonna come back to that constant function later. So, um, so yes, so we're gonna add in the constant offset term uh, later. Right, right now we're assuming that uh, there is no vertical offset. Okay, that the function is, um, is uh, e evenly um, <clears throat> placed on the, um, on the x axis. Okay, so then uh, we basically have uh, this integral to do. I'm basically simply uh, adding in this new form for V of X. Now, one thing that we can do here is we can um, integrate first and then sum. We can always exchange those two operations. Okay, and so we're going to pull the, uh, the sum out and then have these individual integrals to do for each uh, integer G. Now, uh, we have to eventually plug in a, a row of one in one of the states, and namely the first state, or the state A, as we call it in the beginning, uh, we get uh, that the probability density is proportional to the cosine squared. And so we're gonna now insert that into uh, the integral. But one thing that we have to also remember is that uh, that has to be normalized. Okay, and so that gives us uh, this coefficient b out front as 2 over a. And so then you see that that comes out as a constant uh, out front. Uh, and then it can also pull the v sub g out of the integral because as far as the integral is concerned, it's a constant. I can't pull it out of the summation because uh, obviously it has different values depending on the capital G. But I'm left with uh, this integral to do. There's a cosine squared of pi over a times x and then times a cosine of g uh, two pi over a times x, right? So this one comes from the probability density row one and then this comes from the lattice v sub x, potential energy. Okay, so 
Now we're going to turn to a trig identity. Uh, we're going to um, write the cosine squared in terms of uh, one plus the cosine. Notice though, I get an additional factor of two in here. Okay, so that's just a standard trig identity and I'm going to insert that into the integral. Okay, so instead of cosine squared, now I have this expression. Uh, I also pulled out the, the two out front, so this becomes a one over a, and then I have uh, what I had before here. Okay, and so um, then I'm going to distribute. There's a one here. I'm going to multiply this out, and I, I basically get two integrals. The first one just has the cosine of g times two pi over a times uh, x. Okay, that that bit. And then here is uh, the integral of the product of two cosines. So this, uh, the nice thing here is that this here is gonna be zero, right? So the cosine is a periodic function uh, and it dips, so it first starts out positive and then dips negative, right? And so the integral over one period then is going to be uh, zero. And I'm really just left with the second piece. And the second piece is also nice because we can think of orthogonal functions here, right? So um, <clears throat> the uh, cosines, uh, cosine of nx is a set of orthogonal functions. And so when I look at this integral, I have the product of two cosines there. And we know that that's going to vanish unless uh, g is equal to one, right? So when this g here is equal to one, then I get uh, the same cosine multiplied and I get a cosine squared. But for any other cosines, uh, for any other g values, for instance, g is equal to two, I get here cosine, uh, you know, cosine of something times x times the cosine of twice that something times x. Those are two orthogonal functions and the integral over one period is going to be zero for that. So in this sum, sum in this sum out here, where I'm summing over all integers g, only one term in that sum will survive, namely the g is equal to one term. Okay, so when g is equal to one, as we said, this turns into a cosine squared and um, then uh, the expression really simplifies down you see that I, I have now gotten rid of the summation over all g because only g is equal to one survives. Okay, and so this has really been simplified down quite a bit. The integral is easy to do, uh, do a change of variables and so on. You see that that will be eventually just a over two. And so we get a very simple form for the potential energy of an electron when it is in state one or state A as we called it, right? So that is uh, a one half uh, uh, G's times this first Fourier coefficient. This is how, how we really should interpret that. Okay, potential energy in state one is given by uh, the first co Fourier coefficient of the potential energy V of X. First Fourier coefficient of V of X. So this is what uh, this is what this year represents. Um, it is nothing other than the first Fourier coefficient of the of x. So this is the state where the um, the electron is uh, sort of in between the ions, right? And so now. Uh, we might want to uh, repeat this analysis for state two, where the electron wave function or probability density is maximized right on top of an ion. So we do the same thing again. Okay, folks, uh, I had to briefly go back uh, in my notes. No, it actually, I got that wrong. State one is the one where it is um, focused over the uh, ions. And state two is where the uh, probability density is maximized in between ions. So just like we said before. 
Uh, sorry for that uh, snafu there. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to uh, repeat the uh, calculation for state two. So again, just to be clear, state two is um, the state where the probability density row two is maximized uh, in the interstitial space between ions. All right. So <clears throat> basically, the only difference here is now we have a row two instead of a row one. Uh, and row two is going to be uh, proportional to the sine squared. Okay, here I'm going to again use uh, trig identity. Before it was a cosine squared, now it's a sine squared, and I can look that up in a table, write this trig identity, and I get one minus cosine of twice the argument. Okay, again, a trig identity. And um, What's interesting here is that the only difference now is a minus sign. Okay, if I plug that back in um, for row two, uh, the, the whole integral and the sum would be identical, but except for that particular minus sign there. That used to be a plus, now it's a minus. Okay, and so that's good for, that's good, it really makes life easy for us now because we don't have to redo the whole thing uh, we can immediately say that the result will be um, the same just uh, with a minus sign out front. Okay, so we could repeat the whole steps again, but the minus sign will carry all the way through and we'd be left with minus one half times the first Fourier coefficient of the potential energy. Okay, so um, let's go back to this picture. We have um, an energy gap there that we'd like to understand. We call it delta E. Okay, fine. And um, uh, delta E here, obviously, the um, just the difference between the potential energies of the two states. The kinetic, their kinetic energy would be the same. We're, we are, after all, at the same K value. Right, so there's no difference between these two states in terms of their kinetic energy. The only difference comes in from the potential energy. And so we just have to, um, we just have to um, subtract the two and uh, what we get then is um, a potential energy difference that is equal to the absolute value of the first uh, for your coefficient, V sub G is equal to one, as I call it, okay? You might have to put an absolute value around that because that would be negative uh, first for your coefficient. But uh, that is uh, what we end up with, a fairly simple and straightforward result that that band gap is given by the uh, first Fourier coefficient of the potential energy. Okay, very nice and clean result here, okay? So now we can say, all right, so this is fairly general, this result. Um, but uh, can we apply that result now back to the chronic penny model? Okay, so we have a particular prediction there uh, for the chronic penny model. Um, so, so far we've, we've just talked about a general V sub X that's periodic and therefore can be, can be represented by a Fourier series. But what about this particular model, right? So we need to look at the specific V sub X of the model and the specific V sub X, we've never actually written it down in mathematical form. We've just said it's a, um, a sequence of spikes, right? These pulses, but we also let the pulses shrink in width and uh, uh, increase in height. And so we're basically getting uh, a series of delta functions, okay? So this is what I'm representing here. We basically have these, these delta functions, these spikes. Where are they? Well, they are uh, at um, every n times a on the x-axis, right? And so we let, let n be zero for a moment, then we just get uh, the delta function of x. Well, that's a delta function that's centered um, at the origin, okay? The next delta function in the sum would be centered at x is equal to a, um, 
if n is equal to minus one, then it would be centered at n uh, at x is equal to minus a. And so you get this this uh, this this whole uh, sequence of or series of delta functions that are spaced a apart. Okay, and then uh, on the x-axis, and then here uh, the prefactor is just the strength of the delta function. When we talk about the strength of the delta function, it's the integral, right? It's the the integral. Um, the integral of the delta function itself is, is always one, because but we want the integral to be v not b, so we have to multiply that out front. Okay, and so now all we have to do is to uh, basically extract the first Fourier coefficient from that particular v of x. We have now the v of x given in mathematical form, okay, using the delta functions. Can we get out the first Fourier coefficient from that from that mathematical form. Well, how would you calculate the first Fourier coefficient for any function, v sub x? Well, here's the formula. This is how you would do it, right? You would take this arbitrary function, v sub x, multiply by the cosine, um, <clears throat> where we said g is equal to one in here. Okay, there's no g anymore there because that was set to one. So multiply by the cosine and then integrate. And then there's also a normalization constant out front. So that's how you would do it. That's how you would extract the first Fourier coefficient. And now we can plug in what we know v of x to be from the chronic penny model. Okay, so now we plug in uh, the v from the chronic penny model. So what do we get? Well, it looks complicated, of course, now because um, we just plugged it in. Okay, so this, uh, here's just some, and you can imagine what happens next. And we pull the sum out front. Okay, so again, we do an, a, a change of operation, an exchange of operations. So now we have this integral here to do. Okay. So, um, and the integral runs from minus a over two to a a distance of one lattice spacing. Okay, getting a little bit complicated, but um, we'll see this simplifies down really nicely because um, there's really only one delta function in that range between minus a over two and a over two. And that is for little n, of zero, namely the delta function that's right at the origin will be enclosed in this interval. The delta function next one to the right and left, they're actually outside of this interval of integration, right? So the next one is sitting at x is equal to a and uh, minus a. Well, that falls outside of, the, uh, of this uh, range of integration and therefore, um, outside of the limits of integration, therefore they won't matter at all because inside of this, uh, this interval, those delta functions would just be zero. Those delta functions would just be zero. So we come here down to the next line where I, I've basically eliminated the sum because only one term again in that sum survives, namely the n is equal to zero term survives. So I've, add, I've, I've set n is equal to zero here. That then leaves me just with that particular delta function centered at the origin and uh, multiplied by the cosine. Okay, so this is an actual easy integral to do. If we know something about delta functions, this is a very easy integral to do. Namely, we just have to plug in zero for the argument in the cosine. So that's what we'll do uh, here. Okay, we just have to uh, plug in zero and that will be the result of the integral. It's nothing other than uh, two over a times v naught times d. Cosine of zero, after all, is one. Okay, so we get a, a very simple result here um, for the first Fourier coefficient of our chronic penny model. And since that is also equal to the band gap at k is at pi k equals pi over a well 
and that band gap is equal to two over a times the barrier strength b naught times b. We'd like to sort of now uh, verify this numerically. So we want to go uh, and compare this to what Mathematica told us. Okay. So we have to translate that into uh, Mathematica lingo. Okay. And so uh, in terms of the capital P, barrier strength, uh, we get this kind of expression. Right. So the P is not just V not B, there was also a prefactor. And so I'm going to use that now. I'm going to write uh, this um, band gap energy uh, in terms of capital P so we can make contact with our Mathematica uh, file. Okay, furthermore, in the code also, we have to non-dimensionalize everything, right? So um, basically E was just equal to K squared, the prefactor was just one, so H bar squared over two M was just going to, was just set to one. Also, we set little a to one, as you remember. Okay, and so, um, so this, uh, here we have uh, an h bar squared over m, okay, but h bar squared over two m is one, so h bar squared over m has gotta be two, the a is one. We're gonna get a band gap size of four capital P. And uh, that is, uh, uh, something that we can check. That's the prediction. Coming out of this uh, analysis now is that we would expect a, a band gap of size four times P in Mathematica. So, you know, we'll just have to check, but it, it is nice that it's proportional to P first off, because if P is zero, we don't get any gaps. We saw that that's just a free electron. And so that makes sense. If I plug in P is equal to zero, I get, a, uh, I get, I get zero. And we also saw that the band gap was sort of proportional to uh, this barrier strength P. As I increased it, I opened up the band gap uh, and it seemed fairly linear, so that makes sense. But we still have to check whether that is really a four. Okay, so that's a nice result that we can actually now go back and verify numerically. Okay, so check it. It's an exercise for you. All right, so <clears throat> one thing I need to go back to is this assumption that we made initially that there was no DC offset in V of X. And that, that is actually not the case, right? The V of X is below the X axis. So there's gonna be uh, definitely some, some offset there. And the, qu and the question is, uh, what happens if we add, add that in now? I didn't want to overcomplicate the analysis from before, so I left it off there. And uh, we can see that it won't make a difference, actually, uh, in the final result from before, namely the size of the, the band gap at pi over a. It won't, it won't actually change that. But um, we do need the DC offset in order to explain the, um, uh, the gap at k equals zero. So the fact that the band doesn't start at zero, that energy is equal to zero, but that it's offset uh, a bit. Okay. And so um, now uh, we would add that in, right? So before we just had this term, now we're gonna add in a DC offset. DC just means constant offset uh, vertically. Okay, and so that's the new term. And how do we get it? Well, uh, from a Fourier series point of view, it is simply just the average of the function. So if you integrate the function, um, you know, over one period and then divide by the length of that interval, you get the average of that function. That is just the, the constant offset. So all we have to do is have to plug in what we know V of X to be into this integral and uh, we should be able to evaluate that DC offset for our chronic penny uh, potential energy landscape, okay? So that's uh, what we'll do next. But I'm gonna have, have you do the analysis. What you should find is uh, that the result is V not B over A. Yeah, that should be, that should be the, the result. 
and then if we translate that into mathematical language, it would it should translate as two times capital P. So again, we 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 should check it. Here's a, an actual testable prediction that comes out of our theory is that the um, the offset at uh, the origin should be um, the um, should just be equal to two times p. So again, that sort of makes maybe some sense uh, in the sense that p equals zero results in no offset, and the parabola would start right at the origin. And as we now increase p, the barrier strength, uh, we get this shift up. Why is it up? Because this, uh, you, you can think of the um, potential energy landscape for the chronic penny model. These are a sequence of pulses that start at zero and then spike up. So there is an average to that function that's positive, right? So there's a, a positive DC offset in this particular model. And so that uh, gives rise then also to um, a, a positive energy offset. Okay, so um, finally then, just to summarize, what we're finding is that this um, band gap uh, at um, pi over a is expected to be four times p in Mathematica, okay? and that um, this um, at k equals zero, that, uh, that offset in energy should be two times p, so half that. So again, this is a, a testable prediction uh, and I'll leave it up to you to actually test that. Okay, thank you.